course. I know there's been a few inquiries about uh, people that can't attend either the first or the second meeting. We have, we are, as I, as I mentioned in my communication, holding two meetings to try and cover multiple time zones and, and provide as much access as possible. But we are also going to record both meetings and, and make those links available. So welcome everybody. My name's Alex Terords. I know many of you, but many of you I don't, and, and, I'm, and I'm not now keeping track of, of all the names that are appearing on the screen, which is excellent, which is, which is fantastic from my point of view. So, so thank you wherever you are. And, and uh, it's, really, it's really my pleasure to, to open this, this first meeting of, of Anticon, the, the Antarctic Scientific Research Program, Integrated Science to Support Antarctic and Southern Ocean Conservation. As I said, my name's Alex Terords. I'm one of the chief officers of Anticon, and together with, with Metro Santos from, from Argentina, we, we, we lead the, the steering committee, and I'll, and I'll give you a little bit more information on the makeup of that steering committee as I, uh, as I, as I go through my first uh, introduction and overview presentation. But what we'd like to do in this meeting today is to let you hear from, from us as a steering committee, let you hear some of the, uh, some of the background and, and some of the key objectives of Antarcon, some of the ideas we have for the future. But I think more importantly, what we'd like to do is, is to hear from you. Metra and I led the, the program planning group, which for a pretty long two and a half years, we put a, a pretty detailed proposal together for the Antarcon initiative and we, we had some good engagement through that through that program planning group. We had we had members from all over the world from, from various career stages and across multiple disciplines. And and now is the time to engage further. And so we think we've got a good starting point, but it, it is very much still in many ways a, a work in progress. And I think that's what these initial meetings are, are hoping to to do is to not only let you as, as the broader and, and, and interested community hear from us, but also for us to hear from you. And so I guess that's another good reason as to, to why to record this. It's not going to be possible for, for me or indeed any of, of the steering committee that are in attendance tonight to, to make enough notes to capture all the discussions. But, but if, uh, if we record it, we can hopefully come back and, and revisit it. <clears throat> so I will, I will start my presentation. Uh, we, we, I've sent the agenda out. Um, the agenda has gone out, uh, hopefully, to, to most participants, but it's a, it's a pretty simple sort of uh, plan today. We hope to, I'll give you a, an introduction and overview, and, and then each of the theme leads will, will, will also provide a short presentation. But at the end of each presentation, including the, the first one and, the, and, and throughout the meeting, there'll be a um, ample opportunity for, for questions. And, and I'd encourage you to, to ask questions uh, either by un unmuting yourself or by or by putting something into the chat and, and we'll try and keep track as, as best we can. So if you just bear with me, I will, I will share my screen. So as I said, I'm, I'm presenting this on behalf of the steering committee and, and, and myself and, and Mercedes Santos are, are leading the steering committee. The name of the, of the scientific research program is, is up there and, and I'll just, just say it again, it's integrated science to inform Antarctic and Southern Ocean conservation. And for those of you who aren't familiar with SCAR scientific research programs, these really are the flagship groups of SCAR that, that SCAR supports. And I think they're, they're some of the most important groups that SCAR supports because it really does provide an opportunity for researchers to come together under a common cause for, to, to provide and facilitate and, and, and coordinate research under, uh, to, to deliver into a number of key, key objectives. And, and in, this, in this respect, uh, we have we have had over a number of years some very very successful SCAR scientific research programs, and we can only aspire to to Antar for Antarctica to be as successful. Because we we do have a great foundation from these previous scientific research programs, and and Antarctica really does hope to to build on these. I want to focus on the why for a little bit 
in the first uh, couple of slides here because I do think the why is probably one of the most important aspects of any of these new initiatives. And really that's, that's the, 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 the main sort of reason for, for, for why we are coming together here is to understand what, 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 um, why Anticon's coming to being and what we hope to achieve. In addition to building on the foundation of the previous SR scientific research programs, we also, of course, have a number of still very relevant questions that were identified during the, the SCAR Horizon scan. And as I've already alluded to, one of the, one of the primary sorts of uh, reasons is that more and more decision making is requiring good science to inform it and, and to guide policy. And I'll, and I'll come back to that in a moment. I guess probably most importantly and underlying all of these reasons is that Antarctica and the Southern Ocean are threatened on several fronts by multiple stresses. Now, whether that be climate change, whether that be human activities, whether that be invasion by non-native species, Antarctic environments are threatened across on multiple fronts. And I think it's really important that we not only understand what's being threatened, what those threats actually are, but also how we can develop solutions and strategies to mitigate those threats. I think it's also important to, to sort of just to, to provide a little bit more detail around the, the, the importance of scientific research to guide policymakers. And here I just want to reiterate that, that this is a scientific research program. We're here to, to form, to undertake, coordinate, and to facilitate excellent science, excellent Antarctic and Southern Ocean science. We're not a policy group, but what we really do hope to do is to do research that's relevant to, to informing decision making, making and informing policy. And I think the role of SCAR in these, the provision of scientific advice to the Antarctic Treaty is increasingly being recognised. And this was exemplified at the, the 2019 meeting where the Antarctic Treaty, Antarctic Treaty parties acknowledged through a resolution uh, on SCAR's 60th anniversary that, that how important the role of SCAR was in providing scientific advice and supporting the work of the Antarctic Treaty System. And this was a, a really important resolution for SCAR and it really highlighted the importance of SCAR at the Antarctic Treaty meetings. I think another really important aspect of the why is that there really is a strong community desire to undertake research that has impact and that makes a difference and that can contribute to improved environmental management, conservation outcomes for the in, in environment, and more informed decision making. And this was really clear, made clear to me over a, a number of presentations at several SCAR meetings that I was involved with, where, there, there, where I started to talk about the work that I was involved with, with translating science into policy. And the, the feedback that we got from these symposia, from these presentations, was remarkable. There really was clearly quite a, a groundswell of, of desire to, to undertake research that contributes to, to these types of, of, of impacts and, and outcomes. And I guess that's also a very important part of, of the genesis of, of Anticon. As I said, we, we, have, uh, we have made some progress through the, I suppose, the administrative and the, and the planning stages of, of setting up Anticon. We have a steering committee, which, I, which I've listed here. We have two chief officers, Mr. Santos and myself, two deputy chief, chief officers, Patin Van Vuren and, and Alvaro Sotolo. We have two leads for each theme and a dedicated ECR. So for theme, research theme one, we have Heather Lynch and Antonio Casada. For research theme two, Kevin Hughes and Andy Lauther and Jasmine Lees taking on the, the, the ECR role there. For theme three, we have Danielle Leggett and Adrian Hawkins. Steve Chignall as the ECR. And for the synthetic theme, we have Yong Shu Shin and Neil Gilbert taking the lead with Natasha Gardner taking on the ECR role. So this is the core group of the steering committee, but we are also in the process of, of getting representation in an ex officio capacity from other SCAR groups. And I've and I put a list there of, of some of the other key SCAR groups. But of course, we all have representatives from each of the standing groups. And we'll have representatives from each of the, of the scientific groups and, and some of the other uh, key groups within SCAR, because we think it's really important that 
these groups have not only visibility of some of the anti-icon decision making, but also have the opportunity to participate. Throughout the program planning phase and indeed through the, through the early stages of the steering committee, we've, we've agreed on a number of guiding principles. And these are aligned with, the, with some of the key guiding principles of SCAR. And that is, of course, to, to aspire to gender balance in represent, representational and leadership roles, to have good and, and, and adequate representation of SCAR, SCAR member countries, to provide opportunities. And I'll talk a little bit more about this uh, in other parts of the presentation, but really not just to provide opportunities for for early career researchers to, to, to join research networks, but also to, to provide opportunities for those, those um, researchers to undertake leadership roles. We think it's really important that, that we, we integrate research across disciplines. And really this is one of the, the key sort of guiding principles of Anticon in terms of interdisciplinary sense is that we do want to engage across disciplines. We do want to collaborate across disciplines whether that be biological, physical, earth sciences, social sciences and the humanities, but also that the, the transdisciplinary comes from including policymakers in these discussions as well. And of course, across all of this, we want to consult broadly and, and already we've, we've undertaken considerable consultation, but, uh, but it's ongoing and, and more is still required. From a, a broad objective point of, of view, of course, like any of these scientific research programs, we want to facilitate and coordinate high quality research and science. We want to improve the integration of these multidisciplinary outputs, as I, as I just said. And of course, we want to inform where we can international policy response and effective conservation and management. More specifically, we want to increase awareness of contemporary and future environmental issues in Antarctica and the Southern Ocean identify vulnerable species, ecosystems and environments, and quantify threats and inform the development of practical mitigation strategies. These are pretty high level, even, even for, for, for broad and specific objectives, these are, these are fairly high level, and we will go into these in some more details in the, in the theme presentations. I want to spend a little bit of time now just talking about the path to impact because it's, it's, a, it's an important part of Anticon and, and it's, it's not always as obvious, especially to some, some people who are, who are new to, to the translation of science into policy change. And so we have a number of avenues in terms of path to impact. We, we, to influence the key decision makers, we need to, to engage with our Antarctic treaty parties. We need to, to be able to interact with members of the Committee of the Environmental Protection. Uh, we, the, the Scientific Committee for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources and, and other various international and national bodies. We need to be agile. As a scientific research program, we need to be able to respond to emerging priority issues that policymakers may identify for us. And we also need to be able to contribute to the improvement of iterative discussions between scientists and policymakers. It's really important to remember in this, as we, as we as a group try to navigate this path, that SCAR has a, has a body that facilitates and coordinates all advice to the Antarctic Treaty parties or to the Antarctic Treaty system. And this is the Scientific Committee to the, for the Antarctic, to the Antarctic Treaty System or SCATS. Now this committee is an is a integral part of SCAR. And as I said, it's the, it's the key body for, for coordinating and pr providing advice into the Antarctic Treaty System. So Anticon will work by necessity, given that we really want to have impact, we want to engage uh, across a range of levels with these, with these policymakers, we'll have to engage and work very closely with SCATS. And we've already started discussions with both the, the, the Chief Officer of SCATS, Susie Grant, and other members. I'll talk a little bit about the research themes in these overview, but really I don't want to, to steal the thunder of the presentations to come. So I will move through these next slides quite quickly. But essentially we have three research themes. We have the first one, current states and future projections. The second one is sustainability and impact of human activities. The third one is the socio-ecological approaches to conservation. And the fourth theme is a synthetic theme that involves science synthesis for decision-making. Again, I'll, I'll, I'll speak to these a little bit as, 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 over the next couple of slides, but I'll, I'll leave most of the detail to the theme presentations. And here we just sort of touch on a couple of the, of the key sort of guiding 
areas of interest for, for theme one, including vulnerable species, ecosystems and environments, integrated forecasts of change, projected impacts, key chain drivers, and, and also looking at cross biome connections. For the second research theme, sustainability and impact of human activities, we're very interested in the, the current, and obviously the current and future extent of human activities, quantifying the, the anthropogenic risk and, and cumulative and synergistic impacts. Importantly, this theme will also look at uh, the strategy for mitigating some of these impacts. Before I go on, I just want to, to make the point that these themes are not silos. By necessity, we need some structure within the program, but these themes are not silos. There will be a lot of interaction between these themes. And already we, we, we're talking amongst ourselves about, well, where's the line between theme one and theme two? Because there is, in, in many cases, a lot of overlap. And, and those lines are blurry and they're purposely blurry. Really, this is, this is a way of sort of putting some structure underneath the, the broader program, but there will be many interactions amongst the various themes. The third theme is the socio-ecological approaches to Antarctic conservation. This I think really helps to, to stand Antarctica apart from, from some of the previous programs that have come before us in that it actually is one of the first times that we've, we've actually integrated some of the social sciences with some of the more natural and physical sciences and this is obviously done in response to an increasing recognition across SCAR and more broadly that, that this, is, this is really an, a really important thing to do, especially with regard to the management and conservation of Antarctic environments. So again, I'll let, I'll let the, the theme leads talk to this in more detail in a moment, but this theme will be covering off on things like connectivity and social impacts and consequences of environmental change responsible and ethical governance in, of Antarctica in the 21st century and the role of, of resilience in the dynamics of socio-ecological systems. It's, it's sort of was really brought home to me through the planning phase, just how inseparable these social dimensions are from the bio, geo and physical components of, 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 of the sort of research that we're talking about here. So I, I, really, I really think this is a, this is a great, um, at least starting point for integration. And I also think it's important to note that effective Antarctic conservation requires an understanding of, of interactions between humans and the Antarctic environment. And so this, this theme will, will help us to, to, to understand those much, much better. Again, the synthetic theme will, will really be an be a integration theme. It will, it will involve uh, integrating outputs from all of the research themes to inform things like systematic conservation planning, species assessments, identification of vulnerable ecosystems, management of human activities. This is a very sort of, a, this, these are only some, some very, I guess a starting point for a, for a range of ideas because the synthetic theme is, is by necessity going to need to be, be quite adaptable, going to be, need to be quite, quite dynamic in terms of, 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 of the sorts of outputs that it starts to integrate and bring forward. And of course this theme will, Will interact very closely with the, the SCAR Standing Committee on the Antarctic Treaty System. <clears throat> I think it's really important to, to emphasise that we are not seeking to reinvent the wheel with Anticon. I think there's a couple of points to this. Anticon, while it will cover a very broad gamut of scientific questions, is 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 it, it won't be everything to 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 every everybody. And, and these scientific research programs can't, can't fill that void, but, but hopefully the, the, the breadth of, of, of the, the themes uh, is, is wide enough to include a, a, a broad cross-section of the Antarctic community. In parallel to that, it's also worthwhile sort of reiterating that we, we understand that, that much of this work, or well, at least some of this work is, is underway in other groups, whether these be SCAR groups or, 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 or groups that are affiliated with SCARs or, 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 or groups that are, that, are, that are being established uh, in other countries. And so what we are going to seek to do is to, to not try and, as I said, do this work as well, but try and seek to collaborate where appropriate to take advantage of, of uh, researchers that have domain knowledge and are keen to, to collaborate with us and to, to help to build these networks. And I think Anticon can be, can be really successful in, in, in bringing researchers together from a range of groups to uh, 
a, a to, to sort of try and make sure that the, that the sum is, is, is greater than the parts. And, and I think that's something that, that we've, we've talked about as an anti-icon steering group and something that we feel like anti-icon could, could do really well. In terms of our recent activities, we've had four steering committees so far, uh, late last year and early this year. We have a mailing list now in operation. We have um, some social media sites that have been registered. We've had some smaller meetings amongst the themes to identify priority research areas and activities. And we've also made some updates to the, to the anti-icon website. Something that, that we think is one of our most important areas of focus is the provision of opportunities for researchers and capacity building. We will be holding training workshops. We will be facilitating fellowships to these workshops, to, to other learning opportunities, uh, including hopefully the opportunity to, to be exposed to international meetings where, where interested researchers interested early career researchers in particular can be exposed to just how science is brought into some of these international policy forums. We also hope to form a program advisory group. As I mentioned earlier on, we had, have had a very knowledgeable and enthusiastic and passionate program planning group. We'd like to use those uh, members of that group who are, who are still interested in being involved and who aren't members of the steering committee to, to join a program advisory group and also other researchers who, who would like to be more actively involved and, and, and have it take a, take a stronger, uh, I suppose, perform a stronger link to, to the decision making and, and the activities that are going on with Anticon. And so this program advisory group will be a largest group. It'll be in the vicinity of sort of 50 to 70 people. It'll be managed by, by some members of the steering committee, but it'll also provide a, a more detailed way of engaging with a, with a broader cross-section of the community. We also wanna make sure that we, we are creative in the way that we think about our communications and, and the way that we, we disseminate the, the research that we're doing and the activities that we're undertaking. And for someone like me, who's, who's been around a fair whole while and, and who probably isn't the most active social media user. And, and I look at some of the things that, our, that our, our, our younger researchers and our early career researchers are, are, are doing with communication and outreach. And, and I wanna be able to, and indeed the steering committee wants to be able to take advantage of some of these, some of these creative and, and novel ways. And I think that, that we, we wanna provide the opportunities for people to, to help us with that as well. <clears throat> I've put up here a timeline of some deliverables and milestones, and, and you can see here it's, it's, it's somewhat generic, but it does reiterate our focus on firstly, engaging through workshops. And we think, especially in a, in a world where our travel future is uncertain, that, that workshops are a successful way of engaging, and we'll be looking at, at, a, at a range of methods for, for engaging virtually and, and perhaps even in person down the track. Certainly one of the, 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 from a specific point of view, this year we, we intend to hold a, uh, a, a workshop between the three new SRPs, so that's Anticon, Instant and Anclim now, uh, that many of you are aware of the latter two, but please go to the SCAR website if you're interested in finding out more information. So we're hoping to hold a virtual workshop there to, to look for synergies, because again, as I was just talking about communication between the themes, it's also going to be necessary for us to communicate between the scientific, or for us to facilitate communication between the scientific research programs, because there's no doubt we've got a lot to offer each other. As I said, training workshops, interactions with the Star Standing Committee and the Antarctic Treaty System, these are the, the things that we'll be trying to achieve regularly each year, as well as a, a range of reporting, um, publishing our research, of course, and, and making sure that we are we are delivering on, on what, we, what we promise to do in the science implementation plan, which incidentally is also available online. I'm going to finish up on just a, a couple of, uh, a brief chat about um, the next steps. We hope to finalise the representation of the other SCAR groups on the steering committee over the next few weeks. We hope to start the process of setting up this program advisory group to broaden the direct community engagement. And as I just was mentioning, sort of start to, to flesh out some of these workshop ideas and dates, including with other SRPs, especially for 2021. 
And just a reminder for those of you who are who are new or haven't subscribed or, or, or haven't joined our mailing list, uh, if you'd like to join the mailing list, please head to the to the SCAR uh, the SCAR website in the Anti-Icon homepage and or uh, or look up our uh, our various social media sites here. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop sharing now and I'm going to to open up for discussion. If you if you have a question, please uh, please either put something into the chat or um, raise your raise your hand and, and and unmute yourself. Thank you very much. Now I know it's always a bit daunting to be the to be the first one to break the ice, but I am I am positive there are uh, there are some questions out there. So please, if you are if you have anything uh, that you'd like to raise, any comments or any questions, please um, please let me know. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, Alex. Um, thanks for the great presentation. It's really good to see this has all come together and there's a lot of hard work for everyone involved. So thank you very much for that. I was just wondering, you mentioned the kind of wider group, the kind of sort of, was it 60 or so people or something you mentioned? How would people listening into this actually get, find out more about that and how they could be involved in that group is my main question. Thank, thank you, Hugh. It's a, it's, a, it's a good question. It's not one that we've actually got an answer to quite yet. This is a very much a, I wanted to sort of flag this as an idea. If people are interested in, in joining this group, then I would strongly suggest uh, joining the Anticon mailing list, because that's where we'll be, we'll be putting out some information on how we will progress next steps with this. This isn't uh, sort of months away. We're really only talking about sort of some weeks away before we, we start to, we've been talking about this now for some time, and it's really one of our, as I indicated, in that last slide, one of our key priorities. So, so my suggestion would be, well, my, my short answer is more information will come. And the best way to, to stay abreast of that information is to, to join the Anticon mailing list. Thank you. Uh, Lewis, thank you very much for your contribution in the chat. Um, I think it's an excellent idea for us to have a, a YouTube channel. And I think something that we've discussed both in the program planning uh, group in the lead up to the proposal and also uh, through the steering committee is that we would really like to start to uh, develop some training videos as well. So we can have some, some, some informative videos, some outreach type videos, but I think we'd also like to start having some, some training videos. And look, in, in, again, in the in the world we are we are currently in, without uh, without these the, the sa necessarily the same travel opportunities, without the same opportunities to meet face to face, I think pr the providing training videos on 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 areas of interest uh, to, to to people in in the early stages of their career in particular could be a great way to go, and we could use a, a something like a YouTube channel to to disseminate those, excuse me, really effectively. So thanks, Lewis. It's a great idea. Renuka um, is interested in, in knowing more about how to get involved in particular themes. And, and that's the next stage of, of this presentation, uh, of, of this meeting, I should say, is to, is to let the, the themes, the theme leads talk and to, to <clears throat> provide you with a little bit more information about those themes, I think, in the first instance, so people can, can sort of see where their interests are, are most aligned or, or where, where they, they resonate the most. Uh, and, then, and then we can we see who's, who's involved in those themes and then, and then reach out to those people. We are, we are still in the process of working out how we will, how we will engage with interested people. And we will be setting up some, some more specific ways of, of, of regist registering online. So having a in a sense, an online database where people can register their their interests and 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 their, talk about their I guess outline their research affiliations, and that then that can be used as a basis for for sort of um, 
developing broader collaborations and, and particularly theme-based collaborations. So it's a thank, thanks, Renuka. Okay, just looking here. We've got any more questions at this point in time? I can't see anything else. All right. Very good. Now, I'll stop sharing. I will now move on to, I think Antonio is presenting the theme one research theme. And so Antonio, if you'd like to, to share your screen, I've stopped sharing. So you should be able to, to share straight away and I will, I will mute myself and uh, Hello, Alex. Hello, everyone. Sorry, I'm trying to share, but I don't know what's happened. I think that they have too many things opened. Let me try to, to get it done. Uh, hmm. Okay, here we are. I hope you can see now my screen with my presentation. Well, hello everyone. Thank you very much for, for inviting me to, to be part of this uh, fantastic, um, enthusiastic uh, uh, initiative. We are uh, leading, but I would say coordinating and promoting this uh, research theme, theme number one, is uh, uh, the current state and future projections of Antarctic existence, species and functions. In fact, I would like to say that this is uh, uh, really broad. So we are covering most of the lifetime research for many of the of the people that we are here involved in this Antarctic research. So. It, this is really broad and we need to define, we need to focus a little bit what we are doing. So first of all, let me try to introduce uh, ourselves. The leader of this is uh, uh, Heather Rinch and uh, myself, I am Antonio Quesada from Universidad Autónoma of Madrid. We are very complementary because in fact, Heather is working on very big things, even whales and I'm working on very small things, even viruses. And we are also complementary in terms of biomes and in terms of habitat, because Heather is more a marine um, environment researcher and I am more a terrestrial freshwater researcher. So as you see, this is complementary and we will try to cover all the different um, aspects in this uh, very broad theme. So the key questions to be addressed in this research theme are quite broad, as you will see. The first one is how vulnerable are, are the different species, ecosystems, and environments? How will they change over multiple time scales? So we are now introducing the time parameter here, thinking about also the space scale. What are the projected impacts of multiple stressors, human activities, climate change, non-native species on Antarctic and Southern Ocean species, ecosystems and environments? In here, we are also thinking about cumulative stressors, cumul cumulative impacts on the different environments, different organisms and different systems. What are the key change drivers? What are is, is there any tipping point? Is uh, What are the levels of re resilience of the different ecosystems? And what are the thresholds? And uh, do we have any real irreversible um, points or systems? Can, can we identify those uh, tipping points here? And finally, what is the role of Antarctic species in mitigating the global change and how might they change in the future? 
So as you see, we are combining many different uh, um, aspects, many different ideas, uh, different scales in time, different scales in space, in organisms, on, on everything. So this is, as you will see, is uh, extremely broad and we need to fine tune a little bit our, our efforts on something. So we believe that we should start but by establishing the baseline. What is really the baseline? What is the current status of Antarctic biodiversity distribution of abundance? Many of you would say, okay, this is again the same story as always, because we have been running SCAR projects after 30 years now, and many of them had touched up on this topic, uh, upon the Antarctic the biodiversity, the status. But in this case, we want to go a little bit farther. There are fantastic uh, review papers have been published on uh, biodiversity in Antarctica, but most of them have been covering only published materials. And we know that most of the Antarctic national programs are having monitoring programs, are having monitoring systems, and they are monitoring many different organisms. And, and, and that information normally is not very sexy for, for most of the publications, for most of the uh, published materials. And in many cases, those important data are storage in drawers in logbooks. So we want to re recover, to recollect that information that we really believe that is extremely important and it covers a real, real good information. And the idea is just to promote the, um, the access to those data, to access those monitoring programs and to distribute unpublished data those and un published data. And uh, one of the ideas that we have is to promote sections in different journals to be able of publishing those data yeah, as, as data repositories. So we want to rescue all that information that is um, among all the national programs. And we want to go through that and to make that available. So this is kind of the, the next twist to the system just to get really all the information available. This is only the first step. So the, 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 the questions for the community is first, do you have access of unpublished data or where we can have access to those um, uh, unpublished data of any Antarctic taxa. There are many stations that they are monitoring the seals community very close by after 30 years or even more. So where are those data? Are those data available? Can we have that published in some way? Can we have access to that? Then what are the barriers to uh, uh, um, uh, data sharing, those data sharing? In fact, under the Antarctic Treaty System should not be any barrier at all, should be open access for every single data. So I think that there should not be many, many problems, could be some problems of language, some problems of um, accessibility to the physical materials, but I think those are uh, solvable. We can have a solution for that, not very complicated. And next, Next idea, next question is, which are the taxa that we need more information? Uh, we had a list of all the different taxa that we believe can, can be of interest for everyone in here. But as you can see, this is a complete menu. So we have everything involved here. We have everything engaged. So the question is to identify. Of course, many of the questions that we are posing are questions that they are emanating from the community. We, here and myself, we are only um, promoting the science that is emanating from the scientific community. We are not delivering the, uh, the, the rules or, or, or the schedule for the different um, working topics. So the idea is just to get the engagement of the community, all of you that we are, uh, uh, you are there and try 
to organize and sort out a little bit that information, those topics, those um, ideas in something that we can deliver to uh, SCAR and to the, the rest of the community, scientific community in the world. And finally, to the policymakers. That I think that Alex said before is extremely important to have uh, this kind of conversation, dialogue with um, policymakers through SCATS. So I think this is uh, one of uh, their priorities. So which, who, uh, what are the ne next steps? Next steps in this, um, in this uh, theme? Well, first is to have an interested, uh, at least for interested individuals or institutions, it could be institutions for the whole theme. And please remember that you are, we, this is so broad that it's fantastic because it may cover everyone's topic or ideas. So this is, everyone can be engaged in this, uh, in this theme and everyone is um, very much welcomed in this theme. So the first idea would be just to have a uh, uh, list of people engaged, then, or interested at least, and then have a, we want to, to go fast because this is so broad that really is not, um, we cannot delay that. So the idea is to have a, the first pro prospective meeting, it would be a kind of big brainstorming meeting in June very early in a month time from now. So we have to rush, we have to go fast. And then we need to identify tax specialists that are, who are interested in participating in this theme. So that tax special, those tax specialists will lead every group. So the idea is not to recover again and again and again the, the uh, taxonomic inventories or taxonomic ideas, but to have a complete picture of what we are having right now and, and what is available in the next future. I'm talking about half a year or something like that. So I think this is all from my side. Um, Alex, I don't know if uh, any of you would like to have any questions. I will be very happy of answering. Yes, I have a question or more of a comment. Go ahead, please. Um, so, yes, um, I see in the chat, Annick Wilmot also made a comment about that. But there is the SCAR Antarctic Biodiversity Portal, uh, which is a great tool and a network with people that help you find data and uh, publish it. And they also help you, well, they establish data standards, etc., to help researchers in acquiring data in the right way. And uh, there's a new project starting, uh, which is called the Data Fairy. And they will start um, sharing and organizing data courses and sharing best practice information on how to uh, collect data and do the input correctly. So Anton van der Putter is the lead on this. And unfortunately, he can't be here uh, during this first meeting, but he will be there for in the second meeting if you have any more, if you need any more information on these uh, on this platform. Thank you very much. This is a very useful information. We already know that uh, what that uh, biodiversity portal and, and we are, of course, make this will be the basis of everything. So the idea is just to get what is already done is a lot of things done. We have been, uh, all of us, we have been working on, on diversity after many years now, and uh, everything is quite well organized. The question is just to identify what do we need to identify the gaps and try to find out more information that normally is not in those biodiversity portals or, or in the publications. We believe that this could be a, an enormous amount of monitoring efforts. We know that in many stations, they are doing continuous monitoring efforts and those hardly get published, very hard. 
because it's uh, not very sexy for many editors in journals. So I believe that this is one of the ideas, but uh, we believe for everyone that this is a kind of short term. So we are not thinking about using, making this kind of catalog of gaps uh, um, repository, I would say, in the four years time. So we are thinking now, <laughs> starting now and finish that in not later at in the end of 21. So this is the idea. Yes, adding on to, to this um, comment, there's the, uh, still has to be officially announced, but there's the SO, the Southern Ocean Decade Initiative in uh, the UN uh, Ocean Decade um, program. And there's the second workshop, regional workshop for the Southern Ocean, which will take place in September. Um, that will work on, um, well, it's a stakeholder oriented process to identify uh, the gaps that you are mentioning. Uh, so it's create, well, it's gathering information from all previous um, initiatives such as the Horizon Scan, EU Polonet, et cetera. And it's a global effort from the Southern Ocean community to identify these gaps and what we need to address the, these gaps. And uh, so that is also something to keep in mind if uh, people want to, to join the process. It's, uh, it's uh, starting to go quite quickly. Thank you. Thank you again. This is a fantastic uh, uh, point. And we are, of course, we are aware of that, the ocean uh, decade, and uh, we are involved also in many of the different um, uh, branches that that decade has that initiative from the united nations so we're working on that and thank you very much this is a very good idea i think svenia asked if there is still a easy the early career researcher position free for this theme and it is yes we have a, we have a position open and we have to think about that and we will be announcing something but not now not today uh, Antonio, I'll just jump in. Uh, I know Irene's got her hand up, but also um, Steph had a question. How are we planning on addressing the functions of all these groups and species? And indeed, is that something that you think is within the remit of this initial phase or is, is that potentially for an, an, another phase? I'd, I'd be interested to hear your, your thoughts in response to that. Thank you, Steph. This is a very good question. This is a fantastic. We have been thinking about that. And at the moment, we want to tackle the first idea is the catalog, I would say, the, the repository of data, and then just try to get the, um, the pure uh, diversity data. And then the second point would be to go to, towards functional ecology. Just try to go through functions of different uh, groups species so it's, at the moment uh, we want to gather together all the information that is available and non-published and then we will run on the on the on that uh, on that idea but it will depend on the community if the community is interested in working on that we will run on that so it will depend on the engagement of, the, of this commu scientific community I think Irene has uh, her hand raised. Yes. Hola, Antonio. Hi, everybody. Thanks for your presentation. And uh, as well, Alex, thanks for yours. Very enlightening. Um, I just wanted, now I'm wearing my, my SUS hat for the Southern Ocean Observing System. And I just want to remind people that while they are looking for their taxa data, for the the taxonomic information that's that's hidden somewhere um, in their in their on their desks. Please do not forget to look at the at the environmental data and the oceanographic data in particular, which is of great interest to Zeus to collect also. So uh, if it's not only taxonomy we want to do and also but also understand how the system is changing and how how vulnerable the species are and how valuable they are for conservation, then we need information on the environment as well. And so I would just call to add up to the, when while, while looking for data on species, please do not forget the environment and uh, please contact SUS if you have oceanographic data to, to share. It was more a comment. 
Thank you very much, Irene. This is Olaf, by the way. <laughs> this is a very good, very good uh, point, and that uh, we are also aware about Zeus. And but the, at the very beginning, the point is just in in few months, just to have a kind of a diversity, purely diversity uh, things, and then we will go on. And again, I would say depending upon the community, what the scientific community wants to do. So we are, we already, of course, as, a, as, a, as a leaders or coordinators of promoters, I like more the idea of promoters, are, have a lot of ideas and we have a kind of full menu of things. But, uh, but I think that it has to be supported from, from the community. So it's a, something that we are absolutely in that page, just trying to get also the environmental uh, situation, the basic in environmental situation just to be able of searching for the future scenarios, forecasting and all that. Thank you very much, yeah. Irene. Thank you, everyone. One last chance for questions before we move on to research theme two. Anybody? And thank you also for your contributions during the chat, uh, during the, in the chat during the question time, it's very helpful and we'll, we'll be keeping track of that as well. All right, I think now we will move on to- If I could, if I could, Alex, before, before leaving the, the screen, I just want to encourage everyone to participate. My first SCAR project was uh, almost 20 years ago. And, at the, and we didn't have, we have a fantastic group of deliverables. It was a fantastic group of deliverables, but the main, deliverable we had was the international relationships. We have friends from that moment forever, and we have been working together in Antarctica in many places in the, in the continent, in many oceans, and we have been working together for a long time. Many of the participants in that early project for myself, RISC pro program, they are, they have been involved in very high level uh, uh, positions in Antarctic system. So I really believe that this is a fantastic opportunity just to meet people, to share ideas and to collaborate for the future. Thank you, Alex. I could not agree more, Antonio. That's a, that's a really important point on which to finish. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm trying to, to keep more or less the schedule. I'll ask uh, I'll ask Jasmine Lee, who's, who's in, the, uh, in the research theme too, to, to now present some of the, um, some of the uh, more information about theme two. Thank you, Jasmine. Hi, everyone. And uh, hopefully you can see that screen okay and hear me all right. Uh, so as Alex just said, my name is Jasmine Lee and I'm the early career theme leader for theme two, uh, along with our theme heads, Andrew Lothar from the Norwegian Polar Institute and Kevin Hughes from the British Antarctic Survey. So back theme one, I'll just give you a bit of a summary of uh, what we're kind of interested in focusing on a little bit, uh, all about theme two, which is sustainability and impact mitigation of human activities in the Antarctic region. So just as a little bit of background, and as we're probably all quite aware, Antarctica and the Southern Ocean have been changing quite a lot in the recent decades. And of course, this is because of climate change, but it's also because of human activities. And so that's uh, things like fishing, tourism, science, and our science support activities happening. And what we've noticed, and despite our best efforts, we've kind of noted that impacts are continuing to occur upon the Antarctic environment and biodiversity as well. And this has kind of led for policymakers to call out for the best available science and evidence-based science that they can use to help inform decision and policymaking across the continent in terms of conservation and protecting the environment, as Alex kind of outlined at the start there. So this two's key questions are. And so first of all, we'd really like to kind of find out more about what is the current and future kind of extent of each of these types of human activities. 
So where exactly do they occur today and where are they likely to occur in the future? We then would like to know what the risks are related to each of these activities and how these might impact biodiversity and the environment. And finally, and possibly most importantly, what can we do to both prevent these risks and mitigate them once something has occurred? This is really about identifying those conservation solutions and trying to you know, generate science that can be used by policymakers and managers. So some of the research uh, tools that Theme 2 will most likely use to kind of inform some of these questions are things like monitoring, which of course would happen in collaboration with Theme 1 and you know, trying to um, help you know, in, in terms of gathering the data that they're really interested in. Uh, using things like ecosystem assessments and projective models to better understand the current and future state of human activities in the Antarctic. Uh, conservation planning tools, so things like systematic conservation planning, looking at protected areas and things like that, and other decision support tools. And of course, uh, stakeholder engagement, where we recognise that it's really important to get stakeholders involved in the process as well as when that was produced. So that's kind of some of the research tools that we'll use. I'll now summarise uh, some of the main human impacts that we've identified and some of the more specific questions relating to those. Uh, areas. One and kind of a big one here because it's combined. We've got both climate change and kind of that growing human footprint. So as we're all aware, climate change impacts are becoming increasingly felt across the region, uh, but they're not uniformly distributed. So that's kind of a key point here. And we think it's really important that we better understand what the synergistic and cumulative impacts can be of human activities combined with these other drivers, especially climate change. Um, that kind of leads to the, you know, an obvious question of understanding which areas are likely to be most vulnerable to these changes, especially as human activity continues to grow. And finally, something really important is understanding how we can best utilise existing tools within the Antarctic Treaty System in Kamala to kind of better protect species and habitats. So that's things like our Antarctic specially protected areas and designated, designating specially protected species. So next major impact is fishing, of course, very important in the ocean, where we kind of acknowledge that the exploitation of each of the fisheries um, occurs throughout the ocean, but it's kind of localised. So it's kind of uh, really important to better understand how, what these impacts are, both on the fisheries, but also on the wider marine ecosystem. Uh, we recognise that monitoring, of course, will be really important here to help inform uh, scientific advice for managing these fisheries. And in the marine space as well, uh, there'll be really important research feeding into, uh, you know, designating new pr marine protected areas and identifying places that they should be. Our next major impact is pollution. And so from pollution, we've got both direct uh, kind of localised pollution and also more distant things that uh, come from outside Antarctica, but still impact Antarctic species. So some of the more localised pollutants are things like fuel spills or sewage. And then we've got those more long distance uh, impacts like microplastics and persistent organic pollutants. So we, better, we want to better understand how all biodiversity across the space from kind of microbes through to mammals are uh, impacted by each of these pollutants. And then look at how we can best minimise or prevent their kind of release in the first place and then you know, potentially remediate damage once it's occurred. And finally, coming back to that kind of synergistics and uh, how this might be impacted by climate change in the future and whether that might increase the exposure of some species to these pollutants. And next we've got kind of the more direct impacts of human activity. So things like uh, wildlife disturbance and physical damage. So we'd like to know whether and how much visitors do impact wildlife and whether these impacts are cumulative over time. In terms of physical effects, it's like how does trampling impact different ecosystems and how long does it take them to recover? Of course, there's some really great research that's already found that this is, can be you know, decades to even longer. So this rule can really help in terms of future management actions. And finally, in the marine space, it's kind of really important to understand how we can quantify impacts on vulnerable marine ecosystems as well. 
And then last, but uh, certainly not least, uh, we recognize that non-native species are a major threat and a kind of major human impact given that we are the primary transporter of them. So it's really important to understand and lots of research is going into this already, uh, what's, what sites and regions are most at risk from non-native species establishment and which kind of habitats and ecosystems as well are remembering that we're not just talking about plants and vertebrates and kind of marine invasives, but also potentially pathogens. And then within the continent, we really need to understand kind of the risks and pathways for transfer of non-native species inside the continent. So not just um, introductions coming from outside of Antarctica. So that's kind of our major research questions and things that we're hoping to focus on. Of course, we'd love to hear from all of you and hopefully have more suggestions and things to feed in. So that kind of summarizes, yeah, theme two's uh, ideals and objectives at this point. And I've got our contact details up there to start. Um, we recognize that, of course, there'll be a lot of overlap with the things we're interested in with the other themes. So we're looking forward to a lot of collaboration there. And um, I'll open the floor to questions, uh, acknowledging that both Kevin and Andrew are also here to help answer questions. So far away, if you have any, thank you. Uh, David, I see you've got your hand up. Yeah, so thank you very much. Um, it's great to be here and to be listening to this really interesting presentation. I must admit, I didn't um, say anything, Alex, when you were making your presentation, but this is a, a enormously um, broad ranging and uh, ambitious program as a whole. So um, congratulations getting it up. Um, Jasmine, my question, and, it, and maybe you want to bounce it to some of the others is, how you see this research engaging and complementing the research that the Camelar community is doing um, in the traditional relationship between SCAR and Camelar. SCAR is providing additional informative research on things like biodiversity, climate change. So if, if you could just comment on that, that would be really helpful. You're right, that is a really great question. And um, that would be perfectly suited to our marine expert, Andy, if he's available. Give him a second. You might, oh, there we go. Yep, I'm here. Hi, David. Um, yeah, look, it's a great question. Um, as you know, a lot of the scientists who operate in the SC Camelot space are also dual hatted um, and they work a lot in the SCAR space as well. So there's, there's already a lot of interchange at that ground roots level. And I think uh, both organizations can benefit from that cross fertilization. Um, I think there are opportunities for non camera or non directly camera scientists to contribute into um, areas of interest that camera managers. So for a good example of that might be, for example, the, the Ross Sea Region MPA research and monitoring program, where there is a general encouragement to conduct science to, uh, to support that research and monitoring program, and it is not completely um, populated with just scientists that operate in the Camelot space. So I think there's a lot of there's a lot of opportunity for cross fertilization of, um, of ideas between the two organizations. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. I'm just looking for where the complementarity is. Um, I agree with you entirely that there's um, plenty of, of potential for that complementarity. Thank you. I might jump in there as well now, because I think this is this is something that we've given quite a bit of thought, David, and I'm, and I'm really glad you raised it because it just sort of comes back to what I touched on very briefly in my opening presentation, where we, we absolutely don't want to invent the wheel here. We recognise there's a lot of good work going on. We recognise that, that there's not always an opportunity for us. Well, if, we, if we're interacting with policy bodies, then we will do so through engagement with, with the SCAR Standing Committee and the Antarctic Treaty System, and this will actually facilitate those that complementarity probably better than than any other mechanism that we have at, at our disposal. And I think I think that's really important. It's also really important to know that there's there's other SCAR groups like like uh, SCAG, the, the, the SCAR Krill Action Group, which is already 
engaging with uh, with with Kamala and Kamala working groups through through scats and, and national national um, national sort of uh, representation. So look, I absolutely agree that, that looking for complementarity here is is the way to go, and and that's certainly something that we've got at the forefront of our minds. Any other questions for any of the, the of the of the theme theme two leads? I did notice that Steph put a question in the chat first. Is the plan to standardize experimental approaches to quantify, for example, impacts of non-native species on Antarctic ecosystems? So we haven't thought about that specifically, Steph, but I think it's a really great idea and something that we should certainly discuss more down the track. I'm not sure if Kevin has anything else he wants to add to that. Um, I, well, not not particularly. I think it, it does make an awful lot of sense to try and standardise some of our um, thinking and our approaches on non-native species. And, I, and I'm, I'm, I suppose I'm thinking more in terms of monitoring. You know, we, we have a, a wide range of biological groups uh, that may, may have already invaded many parts of Antarctica, but we just don't know about that because we haven't got standardised monitoring across many, many sites. So I think there are, are certainly opportunities there um, and that could extend into um, uh, sort of how these species are actually impacting the environment, not just the fact that they're they're there. So I think there's a lot of scope to, to, to build on that. Thanks, that's a great question, Steph. Okay, we have a question there on, um, could we could we elaborate on, on elaborate on establishing baselines? And I think this is one one of those classic areas of interest that, that is that is absolutely across themes themes one and two. Um, but but would anybody in theme two like to like to, to speak more to that in, uh, specifically? Kevin. Yeah. So this is a this is a huge and incredibly broad area um we do need baselines we do need to have an understanding of, of kind of where we are um, i think we need to be careful though the whole concept of baselines it, it's it's a baseline at a certain point in time and i think there's been a lot of baselines of it established over the years and they kind of you know everyone keeps doing a new baseline i think we just need to kind of um look at what's been done before see if if the if see if we can kind of re relate back to those existing baselines without starting to reinvent the wheel a little bit um, so that we can actually start seeing um, what has changed over the years and how we can actually reduce that further and try and um, not reduce it further but how we can actually prevent any further um, pollution or introduction of non-native species or whatever the, the parameter happens to be. We have another question there. Thank you, thank you, Kevin. Much appreciated, and, and thank you for your question, Brian. We have another question there from from Anik. Thank you, Anik, on on the the idea about um, will there be activities to train and help scientists to participate in the writing of a management plan for an ASPA? Now, this is not something we've we've considered explicitly, Anik, but um, I understand where you're coming from. To be honest, I think that there, that there is certainly scope here for. Um, us to to help, I guess from a from a scientific point of view, um, what might help people understand what how these plans might be written and how they might be um, might be sort of populated with appropriate content. And so, given that these are such an important um, building block of the uh, and and sort of cornerstone of the of the protected area system, uh, and and the way that it's managed through the through the CEP and the Antarctic Treaty System, I think. But this type of idea is definitely worthy of more consideration. Now, I'm not going to sign us up for that right here and now, but I, but I really thank you for raising the idea because I do think it's something that we can discuss further and perhaps um, look towards down the track working with, with people who are involved with this aspect in the CEP and, and, and talk to them about how we might be able to assist uh, from a scientific point of view. Uh, so, so thanks for raising the question. Uh, Jasmine, there's another question for you there from, from Hannah. Uh, yes, I saw the question. And so that is, to what extent are we engaging with the tourism industry to address 
these questions regarding impact of current and future activities in the Antarctic. And that's a really great question, Hannah, as of course we know that the tourism industry is growing quite rapidly until COVID hit at least. And um, there's lots of work going on in the peninsula and across the continent about better understanding uh, you know, current and future extent of tourism activities. And that's something that IATO is really interested in doing, of course. So, I mean, I think there's lots of scope for them to be quite involved in uh, research that's like important that will feed into theme two. So we haven't like, I guess, officially engaged with them yet on an ant icon behalf, but I know the community is certainly doing so and that we will continue to do so in the future. Uh, while I'm here, unless anyone has anything else to add about tourism, uh, the next question from Cecilia was, are microbial communities part of the impact and sustainability, sustainability assessments? And of course, this is driven by the community. And as all of these things, it's what all of the SCAR scientists want to do. That's also kind of in regards to the tourism question too. But at this point, yes, we are certainly hoping to include as much of the microbial community as possible and as the data allows, which will feed into what theme one is doing too. Thanks, Jasmine, and I absolutely agree. I think there's more and more, uh, you know, evidence of the importance of including mic microbial communities in these sorts, of, in, a, in these sorts of thinking around uh, impact and sustainability assessments. Andy, I know you had your hand up before. Did you want to add something to the tourism question? Uh, yeah, I've just I've just put it up in the chat. But if memory serves, there is a SCAR IARTO liaison group um, that was established a, a year or two ago now. I can't remember. But um, it was it was specifically to address those issues of communication between the scientific community and um, the IATO body. So those lines of communications are are already open. I don't recall to what extent they're being um, used, but um, yeah, it'll certainly be our job to to improve those and, and exploit them further. Excellent. Thanks very much for that. And and also they're just noting uh, the contribution from Lewis. Thank you, Lewis. Um, on the uh, the ECAT and CCAT framework approached by the, um, the IUCN and, and IPES. In the interest of, of time, I am going to, to move on now, unless there's any further pressing questions onto the, the th research theme three presentation. Now, I think we've got Adrian. Did I just hit that by mistake? Oh no, Adrian's there, excellent, excellent. Uh, very good, and I'll pass over to you now, Adrian. Thanks very much. Thank you, Alex. Um, can everyone see my screen? Great. Um, so good morning from a slightly showery Bristol. Um, my name's Adrian Hawkins, um, and I'm here to, to represent the research theme um, three this morning. Um, so I, I teach environmental history at the University of Bristol. Um, Daniela Liggett is another um, theme lead. Many of you know will, will know Daniela. Um, she's at the University of Canterbury. And our ECR is Steve Chignell at the uh, University of British Columbia in Canada. The questions um, that we are addressing in research theme three are fourfold. Um, so I'll, I'll read these out. Uh, taking into consideration socio-ecological connectivity, what are the socio-political and economic impacts and consequences of environmental change in Antarctica? What are the characteristics and implications of responsible and ethical governance for Antarctica in the 21st century? What does socio-ecological resilience look like in Antarctica and the Southern Ocean? And fourthly, what are the potential implications of global social health and economic shifts for Antarctic activities? So we're covering a wide range of um, themes and questions uh, within this research theme. Um, lots of uh, interconnections uh, to, to broader um, trends. And I think one thing that we're all stressing is the different the, the connections between the, the research themes. So we're drawing heavily on research themes one and two, and then kind of contributing to the, to the synthesis. One thing I do want to stress with these questions is they all relate both to the ways that the Antarctic environment is changing human activities, but also to the way that human activities are having an impact on the environment in Antarctica. Um, and so in terms of the way we're starting to think about um, these, these linkages and these questions, the, the broad research goals for this research theme are to look at the interactions between ecosystem dynamics, 
policy and management practices. And then this is where I think some of the really exciting things are happening, the socioeconomic and cultural values um, that are informing um, the policy and management practices and also having an impact on um, the ecosystem dynamics. So this is a, a very sort of dynamic um, triangular system that is really at the heart of what we are trying to do with this um, research theme and trying to integrate um, socio-cultural perspectives into, into the work of Anticon. We are, as all of the research themes are, um, in the very early stages of thinking this through um, and what we're planning to do. And we're very much hoping to uh, build on current frameworks that exist and think about ways where there are opportunities for integrating human dimensions research into this. So one of the, the quite promising angles that we're, we've started to discuss is to think about the, the bioregional um, or biogeographic region approach to Antarctic conservation. Uh, so lots of work has been done. Um, here is a paper from 2016 um, that Alex and Jasmine um, authored. And one of the ideas that we have for Research Team 3 is to try and develop this and build on it um, to move from biogeographic regions to biocultural regions, or perhaps better, socio-biogeographic regions. If anyone has any strong opinions on the, the name, please let us know about that. But I suppose what we mean here is that we might have quite similar um, biogeographic regions in different parts of the continent, but the management challenges may be quite significantly different depending on um, the different economic activities. So for example, tourism in the Antarctic Peninsula, there might be differences based on whether there are multiple Antarctic programs working in a region or just one or two. So to really explore um, this, um, this idea of moving from biogeographic regions to biocultural um, regions. And I think one way that we've started to think about of doing this would be to take two or three representative parts of the Antarctic continent and come together um, for a workshop or series of workshops and really start to explore how there are differences and similarities across these different um, biocultural regions and how that impacts the management and um, protection of the environment in, in Antarctica. So the, um, we've talked a little bit as well about sort of our, I don't know, intellectual framework for, for, for doing this. And one of the things that I found quite helpful in my work in the McMurdo Dry Valley region of Antarctica has been this emerging field of critical physical geography um, that is making a real effort to, to sort of bring, um, to take seriously both um, physical geography and human geography in, in this case. So we're using, or we're, we're putting this forward as, as a way to help us think about um, what we're doing with this, with this theme. Um, critical physical geography is trying to, to study both the biophysical and the socio-political processes driving environmental change. It sits between pure physical and pure human geography, um, emphasizes mixed methods, so we'll be drawing a lot on the, the tools being used by research themes one and two um, and other, other work happening in Antarctica, um, thinking about things like social network analysis, bibliometric approaches um, to, to these studies. Um, I'm a historian, so I'd like to dig back into the uh, historical archives to find different things um, and contribute those to this. So very much a mixed methods approach. And then the reflexive practice, and I think this is really informing the whole work of, of Anticon, something that Alex mentioned at the beginning, that we're really being careful about um, thinking about a, a regional approach, uh, different um, career stages, um, gender balance in this research, and critical physical geography emphasizes things like that and how that actually impacts the science that gets done in um, places like Antarctica. So this, this may well not be the the only framework, but we're, we're, we're sort of proposing this as a useful way of um, thinking about the work of our, of our research theme. So um, I'd be really interested if you have any questions about the, um, the approach, uh, the different potentially regions that we might um, pick for workshops to compare and contrast these um, socio-cultural um, bio regions um, and any other questions you might have. Thank you very much.
Ah, I see you have a, have a question there. Um, I have a question for you, Adrian. Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, I guess picking up on the last point that you mentioned, are there any particular regions that you have in mind already to focus upon? Um, and, and if so, sort of what went into or will go into identifying those um, areas? That's a, yeah, that's a really good question. And that is something that we're very much open to, to suggestions. Um, as you know, Hannah, a lot of my recent work has been in the McMurdo dry valleys. Um, I think there are some interesting, the ice free areas of Antarctica perhaps lend themselves to a comparative approach because of similarities of ecosystems, but often quite different um, sort of socio economic um, cultural backgrounds that they're operating within and the national um, programs working in different parts and the, um, there, there would be ice free regions in the Antarctic Peninsula where there's a lot of tourism, for example, that would compare and contrast quite interestingly, potentially with somewhere like the, the McMurdo Dry Valleys. But I very much don't want this just to be driven by, by our research interests. So other, other opportunities to compare and contrast, um, there may well be some interesting marine opportunities as well, um, different, um, the, the Ross Sea with um, areas off the, the peninsula or something like that could, could be really interesting for, for this. Thank you, and, and thank you to Lewis for, for your contribution there. We'll be very interested to see, to see uh, the outcomes of that work once it's, once it's available. Do we have any questions, any other questions for, for Adrian? Okay, I'm not seeing any more at this stage. Thank you again. and and. If you, hopefully, if you were if you're keen to get in contact, uh, you, you you took down some of the details at the end of uh, at the end of Adrian's presentation there. And again, just a reminder that this is this has been recorded. If you uh, if you wanted to revisit any of the of the content or indeed any of the of the key contacts. Okay, now um, with, that's the last of the the research themes that we'll be presenting on this evening. We're a little over time, but I think in the interests of of uh, engaging and sort of um, having these sorts of broad range of discussions, I, I feel like we, we, we're doing pretty well under the circumstances. What I'd like to go to next is the, the synthetic theme. And I think Neil, you're, you're the, the theme lead for this that's, that's presenting, presenting today. If I could pass on to you, please. Thanks very much. Thank you very, very much, Alex. For some reason, my screen doesn't want to share. This is rather annoying. I apologize, this isn't going to work, I don't think. I'm on a laptop in a hotel room in, uh, in Wellington at the moment. I should have tested this beforehand. It doesn't look like it's going to work. Hyung Chul, do you have the presentation available? I'm wondering if you can share it on your screen and then I can talk to it. Sorry, everybody, bear with us. That's fantastic. Okay, thank you, Young Chul. I appreciate that. Apologies, everyone, for the slight delay. So I'm talking on behalf of the uh, the synthesis uh, theme. This is um, Hyung Chul Shin from um, Korean Polar Research Institute, and Natasha Gardner from the University of Canterbury, and uh, and myself, Neil Gilbert, um, an independent consultant based here in Christchurch in New Zealand. And we've got the responsibility of um, working on the issue of integrating the research that's being, do, uh, being undertaken 
and delivering this to uh, the, the policymakers uh, in the Antarctic Treaty System. If we can move to the next slide, please. Thank you. SCAR, as, as is well known amongst this, uh, th this group, SCAR has a very long history of supporting the Antarctic Treaty System by providing uh, independent and high quality scientific advice. It's been doing this for, for, for six decades. And in addition to the, the resolution that Alex put up in his slide, which uh, was a recognition from the Antarctic Treaty consultative meeting of SCAR's long-term contribution, um, to uh, supporting scientific advice to the system. I've also just put up here the, the Prague Declaration on the occasion of the 60th anniversary of the uh, Antarctic Treaty. So this was agreed in uh, 2019, just a couple of years ago, where the Antarctic Treaty parties uh, continue to recognize and put significant emphasis on the importance of scientific research not only for its own sake and for the benefit of using Antarctica as a global laboratory, but also to underline the importance of the scientific, scientific research for uh, the management and appropriate governance of Antarctica. So this is something that the Antarctic Treaty Party parties recognize is extremely important and SCAR has a long history of developing this. So we've got a really strong basis for making sure that the science that's being undertaken is, uh, is being having policy impact. And the opportunities to build on that really firm basis uh, are really what we're trying to explore with this synthesis group. So we're, we're, we're looking at trying to identify these conservation objectives that science is needed to support, but also to identify some of the future and emerging challenges that may not be high on the policy agenda at this stage, but may well become issues that they need to be addressing in the future. So that future looking component is also something we're keen to, 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 to take and make sure that there is good alignment between the research that's being undertaken and how that's being provided into the policy realm. So taking a slightly more strategic approach, uh, as I say, building on this very firm foundation that we've got. Next slide, please. So the questions that were posed in the, uh, the science implementation plan for, for this synthesis group, I've just put up onto the, uh, the slide here and they're, they're fairly broad ranging and when I read them back again, they look particularly challenging. But really, um, a lot of the guiding questions that we've, uh, we, we're proposing to try and challenge are really about understanding that science policy nexus, making sure that good quality science is being communicated in the right way to make sure that it's having policy impact. So we really want to understand what the conservation goals are and how science can contribute to that. What the scientific outputs, what scientific outputs can be integrated to inform decision making, and again, harking back to Alex's point earlier on about looking at partnerships that can be built in order to, to foster a good scientific impact. And we know that policymakers tend to, to put more weight on advice that's being provided from across groups rather than from individuals or individual entities. So how can science also be, uh, how can be used to evaluate decision-making frameworks and management strategies and the effectiveness of those? How can we also assist in communicating uncertainty? We know that the policy community likes certainty on the basis for making their decisions, but how can we communicate uncertainty that exists uh, within science? And how can we foster connection and mutual understanding between science and policy communities? These are very different worlds, they live in different time frames, uh, but how can we foster that, that uh, connections and those, that mutual understanding of, uh, of the scientific research that's being undertaken? And how can we make sure that the science is targeted so that it's, it's being delivered in the right way at the right time uh, to increase the, its utility within uh, the decision-making community? Next slide, please. So some of the opportunities that we're keen to explore within this synthesis group is um, really to foster those collaborations, uh, as Alex has, has already pointed out, with other knowledge providers in particular and with key stakeholders. And there's a range of mechanisms that we're very used to working with, uh, joint workshops, making presentations, 
uh, identifying new work streams where we can uh, build this collaboration is something that we're going to be focusing on. Again, working across the research themes and with other SCAR groups to try and do that. We want to be able to be a repository and uh, develop specialist expertise on research communication. And again, there's already SCAR groups that are looking at this sort of thing, and we want to be able to draw on those best practice approaches uh, for assisting the way in which the research that's undertaken through Anticon is delivered into the uh, policy realm. We want to be able to communicate uh, the, the policy needs of the Antarctic Treaty System back into Anticon and into SCAR and look at the, the, the ways in which we can make sure that the, the research community really understands and has good access to the, the planning material that is available through the Antarctic Treaty System so that, they are, that the research community is well informed on those uh, policy priorities. And we also want to in incentivize policy relevant research. And here we have the early career research community very much in mind. And we're keen to explore new ways of providing um, good support and good information to the early research community, uh, in particular through training events uh, as, as one example, so that we're fostering the next generation of, um, uh, of researchers to have that good policy connection. Next slide, please. And this one really uh, sets out some of the uh, early issues that we are wanting to address, um, certainly within this, uh, the, the remainder of this calendar year. Just to pick, uh, pick up on one of those earlier points, we're very keen in particular to map out and communicate the, the cur current policy and management needs. So there's good planning material available, the Committee for Environmental Protection's five-year work plan, for, for example. Uh, there are good work plans in place through the, the various uh, working groups of CAMLAR's scientific committee. But we want to be able to pull these together, map them out so that the research community has a really good understanding of, of what the current policy interests are. We want to develop a strategic engagement plan so that we can look ahead to future meetings and anticipate where uh, the policy, uh, the scientific advice is going to have maximum impact. To do this, as we've already said, we want to build a network um, and partnerships look at those other knowledge providers that we want to work with and, and foster some of those collaborations, again, anticipating how we can um, have that uh, future impact uh, through those various connections. Alex made the very good point right at the very beginning about the importance of aligning this work with the Standing Committee on the Antarctic Treaty System, SCATS. SCATS is the face of SCAR within the various uh, Antarctic Treaty System bodies. And we really want to set ourselves up as the, the engine room sitting behind SCATS uh, to be able to provide extra capacity and build that support through SCATS to make sure that information is flowing uh, through that connecting group uh, as well and effectively as it possibly can be. And we also want to make an early start on doing some of that horizon scanning exercise, but from a policy perspective and trying to anticipate and map out what we can see uh, coming up in future meetings uh, that we can prepare the science for uh, in, in a more strategic sense. So looking ahead, anticipating policy and management needs and making sure that that is well communicated to the research community so that we're, we're prepared to provide that. Next slide, please. And this is just a little graphic really just that, uh, that Jasmine uh, prepared, which really just sort of sums up where the, the synthesis group uh, sits um, alongside all of the research themes that you've just heard about. Uh, but also not just within Anticon, but looking at how we can foster collaborations with uh, other SCAR groups and other knowledge providers as well. So hopefully we can provide that, uh, that connecting framework across the, um, uh, the research providers. And the next slide, please. And the other point that we... Um, we realized in, in developing this presentation, but also in our early conversations within the, uh, the, the theme group, the synthesis theme group, that there is a plethora of scientific information out there in the academic literature. And it must be quite daunting from a policy perspective to try and get a really good understanding of, of what the research knowledge is out there. And so one of the, the opportunities we've got through the synthesis group is to really sort of pull together this, this information, the synthesized information, um, that the, the policymakers really probably don't have direct access to and make sure that it's delivered uh, in a timely way 
and in the right way and in a, in a synthesized form so that it's digestible for, for the policy community such that they don't have to try and trawl through the, uh, the academic literature themselves. So this, this delivery of, of the right information at the right time in the right way is a really nice summary of what we want this uh, synthesis group to try and achieve. And the final slide, please, uh, Hyung Chul. So this is the, the, the group at the moment, um, but as with all of the research themes, uh, the same message, we're very keen to reach out. We're very keen to hear your ideas, uh, the, re the, the ideas of the broader community. And uh, we very much look forward to you getting in touch and, um, and so that we can grow this network um, as we, uh, as we uh, go through the rest of the year. Thank you, and thank you, Young Chul, for coming to my rescue. Thank you, Neil and Young Chul. That was excellent. That was that was really a, a, a great summary of, of some of the some of the sort of the thinking behind this synthesis theme. I know from from some of the broader discussions that I've had that that it's that sort of for some people it, it's it's not not exactly clear what we hope to achieve with this synthesis. <laughs> Think there's a theme, uh, but I think you outlined it, it very well then. And I and I really do think that we've got something to offer with this theme, not just for Anti-Icon, but across the SRPs and, and potentially other SCAR groups as well. And and I've already had some of the discussions with some of the uh, some of the other SRPs about the potential to interact with them through this theme and to help to help those other groups to to um, interact better with, with policymakers. So so thank you very much. Any questions for Neil? Or Hyung Shul or Natasha. Give you a couple more. Ah, Kevin, please. Um, just a comment, really. Um, th thanks very much, Neil. I think that was really, really useful and. and set out um, some of the great opportunities for science policy communication really effectively. Um, I, I do wonder, um, I, you know, the, 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 the environmental protocol um, and the CEP talk about um, things like um, state of the Antarctic environment reporting. And I, I kind of wonder if that's the sort of thing that we might be able to kind of pull the community together to try and deliver, to help the, the, the policymakers understand sort of the bigger picture as to what's happening in Antarctica. But I wonder if you've got any thoughts on that. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, this is um, this is something we've actually been giving some thought to um, here in New Zealand recently. Um, the, uh, the state of the environment reporting, I think, provides a really nice framework, a really um, a useful framework in which we can actually sit a lot of the information that's going to come forward. And it's a framework that I think the policy community is, is quite used to, and it, it understands that sort of approach um, of looking at the, the current state of, a, of, of the of, of Antarctic e ecosystems, the pressures on those e ecosystems, and then using that information to, to devise its um, policy and management responses. So I think it does provide a really nice framework that we could use. And I think that, um, as I say, we've had some thoughts about this in, in New Zealand, and I think it might be something that we could well explore through Anticon. Excellent. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Do we have any other questions for any of the synthetic theme leads? Hannah's made the point in the chat about the, um, the SCAR Action Group on public engagement with Antarctic research, which will be a great contact. Thank you. That's, um, that's noted. There's a question there from Anik about would we work directly with the with the chair of the CEP, and the answer to that, Anik, is is no. We we would be be very keen to to uh, help the CEP chair understand what's going on, but most of that direct engagement would be through the SCAR Standing Committee on the Antarctic Treaty System because there are well established lines of of communication between SCATs and the CEP chair in the CEP more broadly, whether it be through intercessional discussion or, or, or direct discussion with the CEP chair. 
and we've had quite a few discussions with the, the SCAR executive in the lead up to the, and, and the SCAR secretariat. And, and also, uh, I've also given this quite a bit of thought through my previous role in, in SCATS and chatted to, to Susie, the, the new chief officer of SCATS. And, and really, it is, it is not appropriate for, for other SCAR groups uh, to engage directly with the CEP <clears throat> at the level, at the provision of advice level. Now that's not to say that we can't engage at a, at a, at a, at a sort of a, an interactive information sharing level, but certainly at the, at the level of, of uh, at the more formalized level, at the sharing of advice level, uh, we would leave those communications up to, up to SCATS. So there's a little bit of work to do in, in sort of making sure that we, we do get the engagement that we need and we, and we, and we don't, uh, we don't, um, that we use the appropriate SCAR channels when necessary. So that's a little bit of a roundabout way of saying uh, that we will generally go through SCATs, but there, there will be some opportunities for direct engagement with policymakers through through various workshops and other and other forums that we will be, uh, other mechanisms that we'll be, we'll be uh, actively um, promoting and, um, and sort of uh, coordinating. At this point, what, Neil just did not mention, uh, it, were, it has been just three of us until now, but we will certainly try to recruit more people to help us, to advise us in their individual capacities. And we are also thinking of the sort of timeline for this year, how, what additional meeting and all we'll, the career workshops and things like that, when we will have them. But our, our thought is not through yet. I think that's a that's a really good point, Hyung Shul, and, and it's I was going to come back to exactly that in my wrap up. But before I do so, I'd like to just open up the the, the virtual floor for any more questions on on the synthetic theme. Alex, I thought I might just add something about the ECR Please. trainings. Yeah, thank you, Neil. That was great. Um, Somebody made a, I think it was Anik made a comment earlier about um, learning more around potentially contributing to writing ASPA management plans and things like that. If there are ECRs out there or any of the community, we would love to hear more about what you would like to learn about if we were to run these training events. So please do get in touch with your ideas and what you want to know. We're very keen to hear from you. Thanks, Natasha, and and I can only reiterate that that this is and, and I think and I think I may I think I will we'll sort of move into that discussion now because it's something that I wanted to finish on and 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 leave a little bit of time at the very end for questions. What we have tried to do, <laughs> so that's a great that's a great idea, and I love it. We could do some uh, we could do some scenario, uh, some some simulations. <laughs> what a fantastic idea! Uh, that's a uh, that's a it's an excellent uh, an excellent way of uh, that's right that's right Anna <laughs> the ECRs could well solve all the problems but these these are the sorts of thinking that that I'm just really enjoying hearing and and uh, and uh, thank you all very much for your for your creativity and your enthusiasm in participating in this it's it's fantastic but what we have tried to do to uh, in, in this meeting, I was about to say tonight, but it's not tonight for everybody. I can see multiple, multiple time zones uh, across the screen here. What we've tried to do is give you a flavor. So it's not the, this is, this is not how it's going to be. This is a, a flavor of, of what Anticon will and, and could be. And, and, and really what we wanted to highlight collectively is the potential. And I think that's really important to remember here. We seek, you know, despite the, my point about not being everything to everyone, we really do want to be as inclusive as possible. And so just because you, you as an as a interested researcher didn't particularly see something that you research that you would like to do that you think has impact in the, in the sorts of fields that we've spoken about, doesn't, just because it wasn't mentioned tonight or in this meeting, doesn't mean that it's not something that Anticon could be interested in or could facilitate or could coordinate a research network around. So I think that was, that's a really important point that I wanted to reiterate. I think our speakers tonight have done a fantastic job of providing some examples of, of some of the key things that they think are important. But there will be others and there will be a myriad of opportunities over time. The steering committee 
and indeed the, the, the program advisory group will not be the be all and end all, end all of our Kaikon. I imagine a number of, of satellite groups sort of growing up, uh, a number of satellite networks, if you like, growing up around some of these objectives over time and, and through the steering committee and, and, other, and other mechanisms, whether it be meetings or workshops or, or the program advisory, we will, we will sort of try and coordinate those networks and their outputs as, as best we can. And so there is, there is a lot of opportunity here. It will need to have some structure and it will need to have some coordination, but it will also be as, as inclusive as possible. So keep being creative, please, and, and keep bringing your ideas to the table uh, because that's the way we're going to build and grow our networks. And that's the way we're really going to have the impact that we're looking for. That's really all I wanted to say. I think we've had a, a broad ranging discussion, but I would like to open up it up for any final comments from any of the steering committee members or any of the, uh, the audience participants. Uh, again, I've really appreciated the, the, the presentations and the questions that have come, come through so far, but we've got a little bit of time left and I'm, and I'm keen to hear if anybody else has anything that they'd like to raise or any questions they'd like to ask. Alex, uh, have you been thinking of some sort of next event or next timeline stuff in this year? Yes, Hyung Shul, I, we, we, we have, I suppose, collectively been giving some, given some thought to that. And I see from some of the theme presentations that there's already some ideas about some of the workshops that might be held sooner rather than later. I think really my, our collective plan would be to, to, to work on these as a priority and start to put out some, some timelines with regard to events that we would like to hold this year and the, and the potential timing of those. And then, and then some, some, some slightly sort of more um, less certain ideas down the track. But certainly I think one of our priorities as a steering committee will be to, to start to uh, no, no, sort of pin down some of those some of those events and some and the timing of them. So I think I think it's a really good point. And I think a number of people have sort of reminded us that that we we really do actually start to move into this sort of um, implementation and action phase now that we've spent a, a a good couple of months on the on the planning and administration sort of phase of this of this initiative. Natasha's also just raised a really important point. In the chat, that uh, that unfortunately this overlaps with the the the, the Anticon engagement meetings are overlapping with Apex online conference, which is which is which is not not great, obviously. But it is our intention to hold something very similar with a with an Apex focus for the Apex community uh, in the not too distant future. So within a month, say so I, I think I think we can commit to holding something within the next month. To, to have a, have another discussion very much along these lines, so so thank you for that reminder, and also thank you for the uh, for, for, for for sort of pointing out Hyung Chul, that we will need to sort of start to pin down some of these events sooner rather than later and, and broadcast them to the community. Does anybody else have anything that they'd like to add in the in the last few minutes that we have remaining to us? Excellent. All right. Well, I think we'll leave it there. Thank you again to our to our, our presenters. Thank you again for, for your participation. Hopefully it wasn't too horrible a time zone for, for most of you. I can tell you that tomorrow morning's a reasonably horrible time zone for me, but I will be there and uh, muster up as much enthusiasm as I can. And, and I have enthusiasm. And the reason that I have enthusiasm is that I've seen what these scientific pro research programs can do. I've seen firsthand through my involvement with with the Antarctic meetings of the Antarctic Treaty System, the sort of impact that SCAR research and the SCAR advice, scientific research and the, and the SCAR advice arising from that research can have. And I really think we have a lot of potential here to make a huge difference and to improve environmental outcomes, management outcomes, conservation outcomes in Antarctica and the Southern Ocean. Thank you very much. And, uh, this uh, this link to this recording will be um, the record. This link to this recording of this meeting will be uh, will be sent out on the mailing list in the not too distant future. Thanks again.